So the first question is, will we naturally run out of oil and natural gas within the next several decades or begin to run out? So much so that the price of oil and natural gas will go up and it will be self-regulating. And so I want to quote someone I deeply respect. Uh, our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with rising demand for decades. Uh, I said that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, let me explain uh, why we wrote, Arun Majumdar and I wrote this uh, in Nature in 2012. By uh, 2013, the rise in production was um, up to now 7.5 million barrels a day of U.S. oil production. And by the end of this year, it's going to be probably 800, 8, 8.5 million barrels a day. If you look at that green sliver, uh, roughly four and a half million barrels a day oil production, that's actually more oil that's produced by any other country in the world except three, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the United States. Just the increase in oil production is more than in the oil production of any other country in the world except those three. By 1965, the average consumption of cigarettes of male adults was the equivalent of 220 packs a year, including the non-smokers. Okay? And we became a very smoking country. And the blue curve with a time lag shows the deaths of lung cancer in the United States of male adults. And by the 1950s, uh, the medical community couldn't help but notice something strange was happening in uh, mortality and lung cancer. It was rising well above the noise. And so by the 60s, they were saying, this is not a coincidence. We think there's something happening. And in the 60s and 70s and 50s, uh, there was a bait going on. The tobacco companies uh, said, well, look, Correlation does not mean causation. If science really knew what was going on, they could predict who was getting lung cancer, who would not. If they really knew what was going on, uh, they could actually tell us a lot of things, in fact, offer a detailed theory of how smoking causes cancer, and they cannot. Therefore, it might be just a correlation. So not to worry. <laughs> uh, and so for about 30 years, the, muddy, the waters were muddy. Now, in smoking, if you smoke, you incur the risk. You're the one, you as the individual, uh, run the risk of getting lung cancer, 25 times higher chance. Uh, we as adults can smoke or emit carbon dioxide, but hey, it's the children and grandchildren and their grandchildren who run the risk, so I don't see the problem. Right? This is what society has so far been saying. Do we want to take a 1% hit in my style of living because my children and grandchildren, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from today, and for the next 1,000 years? No problem. That's not my problem. Uh, I think it is, but so far society has not embraced this as a problem. The price of solar modules has climbed by about a factor of 40 since 19, in the middle 1970s. That's pretty good, and that means a $20,000 car costs $500, okay? Except not quite. It's just the solar module, not the land use, not the installation. But it's still very significant. What used to be the major cost in solar is now a minority cost. We said in 2011, we're gonna set an ambitious goal uh, for the industry and worked with the industry and said, tried to convince them that you could change your business plans, that perhaps uh, solar energy could go down to uh, comparable to natural gas. That would correspond to a dollar watt. What does that mean? A dollar would buy enough solar generating capability in a module and the electronics uh, and the installation, the full cost, uh, that it would cost a dollar watt. A watt means a certain illumination, you could generate a watt of electricity. And on a rooftop, $1.50 watt. Now, two years ago, 
it was about five dollars a watt in the United States, and we couldn't help but notice in Germany it was half the price. Now, how can that be? Because the solar modules were an international price by then. And uh, so you scratch your head and you say, well, it's because German labor is less than US labor. Um, not. <laughs> um, so uh, we decided to figure out what it was, and we even videotaped solar installations and found that Germans are spending a third of their time on the roofs. So we said, we can learn this technology. <laughs> They got more efficient at installing. Right? The electronics and modules were the same price. Uh, we also noticed that it, the local states and municipalities would have their own rules about solar. And in many places, you would, uh, you would have to have, take out a license. It costs $1,000. Then they would insist on having an inspection before the solar is installed in your roof so to make sure your roof doesn't collapse and then inspection afterwards to make sure your roof is not going to leak and collapse and all this other stuff. Germany, you just apply online. And so we started working with states in the Department of Energy to convince them that you not, there are many other ways to enhance the local city income, uh, but leave solar out of this. Go back to the old-fashioned way, parking tickets and speed traps. <laughs> Um, it worked in Massachusetts, and the price of solar declined by uh, 75 cents a watt. And in California, it didn't work uh, because the towns in California said, no, no, we like the way of generating income. And so you can actually see some states saying, yes, this is silly, and others not. Despite the fact that a quarter of the total electricity output in Spain comes from intermittent renewables, they can manage this. Uh, that also is true for many other countries, and these are renewable energy. Uh, Germany, the, a large fraction of it is biomass, but there's wind and solar. Denmark, it's mostly wind. Our, Spain, it's mostly wind of, with 4% solar. Ireland, it's wind. So you can get renewable energies into the 20s and have a stable grid. All right? This we already know because it's been done. It's not a theory. Uh, and so the question, and, and so many of these countries uh, want to go to 50%. You now it gets harder and harder the higher you go. But uh, just, so this is the existence proof, 3% electricity in Hawaii and solar, is, when the backup generation is diesel, is not a real engineering issue. It's an inertia issue. We're gonna get there. This is not due to a radical breakthrough in batteries. It's just due to the slow learning curve. You improve every year a little bit, every year a little bit, okay? Just like in the graded circuits. There was no big breakthrough. It was over a half a century, lots of little things. Now there are, in the horizon, some potential breakthroughs. There, I see a lot of new ideas in the last decade that we have not seen in the previous three decades. Your battery in your cell phone that you curse all the time, it's actually improved by 50%. Your demands on the battery improved by 70%. <laughs> right, your phones are getting really smart. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's what's happening. Okay, so why are utility companies getting all excited about this? It's getting, uh, in many parts of the world, it's getting really cheap uh, to do renewable energy. It's the low cost option. Utility companies are not really pushing technical innovation. Um, they're a regulated company. Uh, they get yelled at if there's a blackout. Uh, so they don't want to make change. They just want to not be yelled at. <laughs> uh, and, and, they're, and, and, to, and the rate commission say, you know, we want to keep the rates low. So because of that reason, uh, they're moving at glacial speed at the adoption of new technologies, but this is really unfair to glaciers. <laughs> They're beginning to move faster. <laughs> and uh, so this could be very disruptive technology, the same disruptive technology that the internet was to publishing. Uh, and it also is very disruptive in a very good way to uh, developing countries that will not have a grid. And so I suggested perhaps the utility companies can be part owner. In fact, they can own the whole thing. They can own the electricity generation on the rooftop. They can own the battery in the home. 
um, and they sell you electricity. This is not a novel idea. Uh, this is the business model of AT&T in the old days. They rented you a phone for 50 cents a month and they sold you phone service. Most of the solar installations in California today are done by companies who go and knock on the door and say, we will sell you electricity if you allow us to put solar in your rooftop, we will own the solar, we will install it. If it breaks, it's our responsibility. You just sign a contract in 20 years, you buy electricity. If you sell the house, we can work that out with the new owner. Okay? There may be a default charge, but hey, 20 years, we sell you electricity, and we sell it to you 3% less than you can buy from the electrical company. It's a good deal. That's why the majority of solar in California is now being done this way. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about who to contract, and if it breaks, who to get to fix it. They just sell you electricity. What do the electrical companies get out of this? They're in a the growth industry. And they have energy storage exactly where they want it, and it gives them the electrical system a robustness they, they would actually like to have. So, we need a new business model in the United States and probably in the rest of the world, but, but this is, the technology is going to demand it anyway. Renewable energy in many places in the world is gonna get cheaper than any form of energy, period. You can make excess energy at nighttime energy, like nighttime wind. And if you can take this and split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you can take carbon dioxide from a fossil fuel plant, which we will need for backup power, and combine it to form a liquid hydrocarbon that you can put on a big tanker, you can ship that anywhere, and you can store it in your own borders and get a 90-day supply of electricity, and also an alternative to transportation fuel. We don't have this technology. If you don't watch out, you may end up where you're heading. Um, now, uh, when I was in the Department of Energy, uh, we started new funding programs like Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, a new a revitalized photovoltaic program, uh, EV program. And I brought in a number of very, very good people into government that, like myself, would never have thought of working in government. Uh, we had a half a dozen members of the National Academy of Engineering Sciences in the government at that time. Uh, many elected in their 40s, but they were still in their 40s. And there will be at least a half a dozen who will get elected to National Academy of Sciences and Engineering who are in their 30s and 40s, who came in. And if you're of that caliber, and you're, let's say you're at a MIT or Stanford, Berkeley, someplace, you normally don't think of working in the government. Uh, but we got a lot of people to come and work in the government, and uh, because it, it's that important. And just join us for two or four years and go back. Um, and I used to tell them that the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. Uh, Michelangelo said that. Now, since 1968, we've discovered that the climate's changing. It's highly likely due to humans. And although we don't understand the full risks, there are considerable risks and uh, think of smoking. And so the issue is uh, we can do something about it, we should, but it's not gonna cost that much. That's the most important message I have to give you today. It's not gonna cost that much. And so uh, with that, uh, I thank you.